this beautiful May 21st, 2024. Again, May, May 21st, 2024, coming from Newmastown, Pennsylvania, and uh, happy to be with you today with my dear brother in Christ, Brother George Widger. And uh, we will continue on as he has a continual series on the power of the Jesuit order and their coadjutors and what they're up to. So he's a wonderful researcher on this. And so uh, without a further introduction, welcome to the broadcast, Brother George. Well, well thank you. As always, it's a pleasure to be on with you, Brother Eric. Always a pleasure to have you. You always have something new and astounding to to teach me and I'm sure the listeners also. So what do you for us today? Mm -hmm. sure. Or I, I might have something old. So so it's a mixed bag. Uh, my my scripture verse is Acts 26 verse 11. No, I, I mean pardon. Acts 25 verse 11. Acts 25 verse 11. Which says, for if I be an offender to or to have committed a thing worthy of death, I refuse not to die, but that there be none of these things whereof these these accuse me, no man may deliver me unto them. I appeal unto Caesar. Okay, so this is the Apostle Paul writing this. And why do I bring this up? So, okay, I know we've discussed this before, but this has to do with capital punishment, i.e. the death penalty. And I know there are a number of people, many of whom who profess to be Christians who are opposed to it for whatever reason. Um, well, if you're going to do that, you, you can't use the Bible, the New or the Old Testament, to justify your position because the Old Testament clearly supports it, and the New Testament doesn't condemn it. Well, the New Testament supports it in Romans 13. They bear not the sword in vain. The sword is used to kill people. So absolutely, the New Testament validates capital punishment. Okay, well, speaking of... Now, now I, I just want to say that I just need to clarify my position. In principle, I support capital punishment. So what does that mean? Yes, if people commit certain crimes, such as murder, the state not only has the right, but has the application to put them to death in a timely manner. Y yes, they should get a fair trial, but they should be, well, receive their just recompense. Now, you could say, you know, what about people who are framed or are part of like MK Ultra or something? Well, that's a different conversation altogether. All now, speaking of which, uh, <laughs> I know I'm a little bit slow on the uptake, but Almost nine years ago, back in September. Oh, one, more, one more thing, George. Do you have some water to drink? Yes. Okay, good. Uh, yes, I, I do. I have several gallons, so I, I should be good to go in that department. Okay, very good. I just thought I'd check on you, George. <laughs> well, thank you. I, I, I do appreciate your, your concern. Oh. Okay. <clears throat> now, nine or almost nine years ago, back in September 2015, uh, the white pope francis uh, addressed a joint session of congress what he was basically doing is giving instructions to his employees and he brought up several issues the three main ones were climate change what the united states needs to do more to address that and redress it uh, this, as he put it the so-called immigration crisis and what we need to do what more the United States needs to do. We should take in more. Now, granted, that was almost a decade ago when he made those comments. And of course, you know, we need to get rid of the death penalty. So. More destruction of white Anglo-Saxon Protestant Western civilization. That's all it is. Mm -hmm. Oh, yep. well, well, and of course, um, now, this was the first time a pontiff had actually addressed a joint session of Congress. Now, the first, po you know, yeah, I think I had what, what a disgrace. What a terrible, awful disgrace. 
And then nobody got up and walked out or denounced him or called him the Antichrist like Ian Pagely did in Parliament. Utter disgrace for all those people to sit there and think he actually has some authority to be able to even speak to us. What a disgrace. Go ahead, George. Well, indeed. Now, that was back in September the 24th, I believe, 2015, so almost a decade ago. More recently, I Sunday, I guess 60, the uh, U.S. television program 60 Minutes uh, uh, went to the Vatican, and they sent one of the reporters to interview him, um, Doreen o- O'Donnell. Now, what, what does that sound like to you? It sounds like a good Irish Catholic girl, so we'll send a nice Catholic girl to interview the Pope. Don't want to send any Protestant or Baptist to interview the Pope. It might be of German or English descent. Can't do that, but go ahead. Well, uh, and yeah, so yes, uh, she said all, all four of her grandparents were born in the Emerald Isle. Uh, but actually, they're from both sides of the border, Northern Ireland and Southern Ireland. And so for good measure, she got her undergrad and master's degree from Georgetown University. Oh, goody, I'm so glad the Jesuits tutored her. I'm sure they gave her a wonderful education to serve the Pope in his temporal power. Go ahead. Yes, also, not only that, uh, you can go look this up, but uh, her father was a doctor in the U.S. Air Force. So she's almost, she almost certainly has an intelligence background. I'm sure there's got to be some connection. I mean, they just don't put anybody in, in their empire that doesn't qualify and has improved their allegiance somehow. But go ahead. Okay, so the interview wasn't that long. It may be like 10, 15 minutes long. And inexplicably, he spoke in Spanish, which was his native tongue in Argentina, even though he does speak English. As a matter of fact, when he addressed a joint session of Congress, he spoke in English. So. This is a bit perplexing to me. Hmm. Well, so they had they had an interpreter, and oh, uh, he was kissing so up to the he was kissing up to the invaders. They're all Spanish speakers, brown skinned Spanish. Uh, so he's kissing up to them. That's why he spoke in Spanish to continue to back their racial and Catholic in, 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 uh, invasion of those white people that live in North America. And lots of them believe that Bible, some of them are Protestants and those heretic Baptists. We just got to keep invading them and committing crimes against them and keep destroying them to justify our new right that's coming. So I'm sure that was the design to kiss up to the Spanish speakers to keep coming. Okay, so Noreen uh, spoke with His Holiness, and you know she asked him a, a few simple questions, such as, "So, wh- what is your take on uh, uh, <laughs> His Holiness? What, what a joke! What a joke of a title!" But go ahead, George. I'll, I'll try to restrain myself. Oh, okay, I was being I was being facetious when I said that, or His, know, his you, Unholiness. That's right, His Unholiness. Oh, okay, or His wickedness. <laughs> his his uh, unholy wickedness. How about that one? <laughs> okay, so they're talking about current events, and um, no, I, I'm surprised if uh, I'm surprised you didn't ask. Hey, Jorge, do you have tickets to the latest uh, uh, Killer Switch concert? Uh, I think she's in Europe right now. But uh, anyhow, it all seriousness. So she talked to about the two big conflicts right now. Ukraine and Israel, specifically the area that they're calling Gaza. I know there is no Gaza. And he said, well, it's a tragedy, and it breaks my heart to see our brothers killing each other. Who says this? The Pope. Our brothers killing each other. When he hates the Jews more than you can dream, and he also hates the Arabs. Because those are the only two races of people that have biblical promises, and particularly Isaiah 19. Our brothers killing each other. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And he did actually go in to clarify this. And he said, well, it's one thing to have a disagreement with the Israeli uh, government, but I, I won't brook uh, anti Semitism of any type. I, I won't brook Islamophobia of any type. Oh, goody for him. Well, did he come out and say that the Hamas invasion of Israel was a sin? 
that the thousand people that were killed were murdered? Did he say that? Maybe. Of course not, because he was behind it. You, using both Benjamin Netanyahu and that other head of Hamas that lives in Qatar. So no, it's just more pious platitudes or, or disgustingly uh, phased or, uh, or, or, or misdirected platitudes so that nobody knows what in the world he's talking about. But go ahead. Uh, and is he, well, not only is he the white pope, you know, the head of the Catholic Church, he's a Jesuit. Yeah. So he is controlled by the black pope. Arturo Sosa. Uh, mm-hmm. The Jesuits totally yeah. run the Vatican Empire. They totally run the papacy. And any priest that would seriously resist them would be pushing up daisies. So that's all there is to that show. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so, in a, and of course, there's the, the other conflict. There's the Russian-Ukrainian war, which is basically between heretic Orthodox versus heretic Orthodox. Yeah, the destruction of white men, white men killing white men that are Slavs and Orthodox and deemed heretics and liberals by the papacy. So the Pope loves it, just like he loved the English Protestants killing German Protestants in World War II. Protestants killing Protestants, white men killing white men. Oh, it can't get any better than that. (laughs) Okay, Um, so... um and I just want to mention something else about the interview. So she mentioned, uh, Nuri mentioned that uh, she's of Irish descent, as we've already established. And she said her grandparents were born in Ireland. And one of the things that uh, the Pope said is, oh, yes, European immigration. What, what did they say? that When it came to the United States, the Irish brought the whiskey and the Italians brought the mafia. Well, that's pretty much true. And, of course, the Democratic Party was called the party of uh, rum, rebellion, and what's the other one? Romanism? Romanism. Rum, rebellion, and Romanism. That's what the Democratic Party was called. Mm -hmm. Uh, (laughs) Yep. uh, Okay. In in all fairness, not to bespare a whole new uh, ethnic group, the Italians, the Irish. Actually, no, it was not the Itali- the mainstream Italians who brought the mafia over. That was Sicilian. Um, well, actually, as you know, I said, most- they're, they're generally Italians. Sicilians consider themselves Italians. So, I will say though that the average Italian hates the mafia and uh, would like nothing to do with it. So there are many Italian people that do hate the mafia, but because government doesn't punish the mafia, they they're more powerful than they've ever been. Working with a intelligence community, particularly the CIA. But go ahead. Okay, but uh, contrary to what you might see in Hollywood, like uh, The Godfather and various gangster films, they basically have gone underground and mainstream. Yes, they wear their suit and ties, but they're usually conducting their business in boardrooms. My father father as a chief of police in Richmond, California, told me that the mafia has gone uh, respectable, that they send their sons to the finest schools, to run their businesses with the most profit. And uh, that until that is addressed, it will continue to become more and more powerful. Uh, and you actually saw, you know, I made reference to Godfather, but uh, God, the, the third film, the one that most people forget about, Godfather 3, where uh, Al Pacino plays an elderly um, Michael Corleone. And he says, you know, I don't need more guns. I need more lawyers. <laughs> yeah. And good old Al Pacino says the same thing in The Devil's Advocate. When he's playing the part of the devil, he says, what we need is more lawyers. <laughs> but he doesn't tell you that the lawyers are part of a bar association, which is a military bar association. It's a military jurisdiction bar association. Never tell you that part. Go ahead, George. Uh, well, they would have got around to that eventually. Okay, so I just want to uh, change things up a bit. And um, I decided to add this at the last minute because um, uh, I, I, I listen to the radio. You know, I listen to different things, you know, when I'm on, not on with you. And um, there's a program called Classic for Kids hosted by uh, Naomi, Naomi Lewin. 
Uh, she's out of WGUC Cincinnati, Ohio, and it's called Classics for Kids. And it's only about five minutes long, and is where she gives a little tutorial on classical music, composers, conductors, instruments, uh, musical pieces, genres, and things like that. Where it's just, that beautiful white music. Yeah, go ahead. Mm-hmm. Well, yes, and she'll. So she's been doing it for years, and uh, so talk about various topics and sometimes they'll do emotional uh broadcasts like uh what is an aria no as i said this is aimed towards children so it's geared towards people who have little or no knowledge of the subject she said well what is an aria well that's basically a solo in an opera uh that's where the one of the singers does sing individually and then she goes and she tries to keep it as, as simple as p- possible and she talks about different eras of music and things like that. Well, one of the things she talked about, this is 10 years ago, and I wasn't really paying attention. And she said, well, on today's topic, we're going to be talking about nationalism. And I know that m- might seem a bit uh, off-putting for a lot of people, and for many, that has a bad taste because it's synonymous with white supremacy or Nazis or things like that. And you may be wondering, so- why am I talking just so ridiculous. Nationalism well, has nothing to do with white supremacy or the Nazis. You see, the wicked sinners blame World War I and World War II, and particularly World War I on nationalism. If we didn't have nationalism, it wouldn't have happened. That's nonsense. It was all orchestrated by the Vatican for okay. the destruction of nationalism. But go ahead, George. <coughs> well, excuse me, I just need to take a drink. You might need to take a drink, George. Yes. Yes, so sorry for the interruption. So as I was saying, so she was talking about nationalism in terms of music, and people don't realize what a big part that has played, particularly in the 19th and early 20th century in Europe. And because here too, brother. Here you too. had a number of- Here too, it plays a great part in nationalism. You got John Philip Sousa. And you know, when he puts together his marches and his great um, pieces and you know, building up the American people with a sense of nationalism and patriotism for their country. You know, it's it's very stirring music, and it's wonderful. Go ahead. Well, yes, and of course, uh, probably two examples, uh, two, at least two European examples of this were Jan Sibelius and, um, I'm sorry, uh, <laughs> uh, Frederick Smetana. Now, Jan Sibelius, his signature piece was the 1899 Finlandia, which is the unofficial national anthem of fin- Finland. Now, at this, uh, when uh, Sibelius was born in 1865, Finland was part of the Russian Empire, and life was fairly relaxed. But towards the end of the 19th century, Russia, under Nicholas II, began clapping down on the Finns. They said, oh, okay. Uh, the Russian Orthodox Church is going to be your state religion. No more Lutheranism. You had to write, you, Russian had to become the national language. Um, so they're just clamping down. That was under Nicholas II, you say? Yes. Now, I've heard the judge. And Nicholas II was a Russian Knight of Malta. He was completely in the hands of the Jesuits. He's the one who started the worst pogrom against the Jews in Russian history in 1905, I believe. And so he's also the one responsible for attempting to destroy Lutheranism out of Finland, which would be pursuant to the Jesuit Orders Council of Trent. So he was a very sinister czar. He was never killed at Ekaterinburg. He was secreted out of Russia. The book I want to recommend to the listener is The File on the Czar. The file on the czar proves he was never killed in 1917 or thereabouts. Go ahead. Okay, so th- this may sound silly, but um, this, okay, the old joke about the Finns <laughs> is they're the nicest, polite, <laughs> most polite, respectful people in the world. Uh, they're very courteous. Uh, they're well-mannered. However, if you invade their country, uh, that's all out the window. <laughs> <laughs> as it should be, yeah. as it should be. I think the Finns killed 100,000 Russian Soviets in the, uh, what was it, the Winter War. Oh, well, uh, I, probably more like a million. Was it a million, that many? 
<laughs> it was a lot. Yeah. The, and the Finns were masters on skis. And so they can, they did all their military exploits on skis in the snow. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Okay. So Finlandia is only about eight minutes long, but it, he, you get a big bang for your buck, so to, so to speak. Uh, it has a coral piece. And um, it, it, anyhow. Um, Beautiful, so, white, historic Protestant music. It's nationalistic, and nationalistic wants to build a people with a common race, a common language, and a common culture. Something the Jesuits hate. Go ahead. Especially. Okay, so something. White. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. So, um. Anyhow, so later on during the 1940s, during the Russian occupation of uh, Finland, again, uh, under Tsar, uh, under, well, the Tsar, the Red Tsar, Stalin, uh, they weren't allowed, the Finns weren't allowed to play uh, Finlandia on the radio or performance. Just uh, like Hitler, just like Hitler, the dear comrade in arms with Stalin, would not allow Mendelssohn to be paid in, played in Germany. Especially his pieces like the Reformation. Go ahead. Okay, so I, I, I'm, not, I'm going from memory here. I didn't write this down, but uh, also the 19th century, you had a you had a Bohemian composer by the name of Frederick Smetana. Now he is famous for two pieces, the Barter Bride, which is comedic, but even though it's co comedy, it's, I understand it's a very difficult piece to play. Then his other Piece was called Mablast, basically my homeland. Mm -hmm. and so, it's and by, the like, way, that, by the way, the, what would you say? Bohemia? Was that what you said? Yes. Yes. Bohemia was historically Bible reading people. You have the Bogomils out of there and other different Protestant or Bible believing sects out of Bohemia. Go ahead. But, yes. So, just like with Finlandia, uh, Mablast, my homeland, got the same treatment under the Soviet occupation, but it was longer. You're talking from like 1945 until the end of the Cold War. They couldn't play, that wasn't allowed to be played on the radio or the orchestras couldn't perform it like the Czech Philharmonic. And, and Czech, uh, the Czechs, the Czechs are historic Protestants. So that's right. Any any music coming out of historic Protestant like Czechs, uh, not Czechoslovakia, but the, the Czechs, would absolutely be censored too. So again, it's pursuant to the anti-Reformation, anti-Bible, Jesuit Orders, Council of Trent. Uh, can we pause there for a second? I, yes. I just had a question. Yeah, I realize I'm a little bit slow on the uptake, and, and I'd imagine your audience would argue with that. Is why is it that they celebrate, they the judge celebrate anything that is gross, disgusting? vulgar and promulgated uh, uh, through music, you know, through the radio, you know, through television, through the internet, but anything that is beautiful, desirable, they try to uh, suppress it. Because you have to demoralize the population in order to bring the judgment of God upon it. And the Lord uses Satan as his tool to bring judgment upon a immoral and wicked people. So it facilitates Satan's design, what he wants to do through the Jesuit order to destroy targeted populations born out of the Reformation. So therefore, he would bring about the Rolling Stones and, and the Beatles and a host of other groups and whatever, like Tina Turner and all those other wicked centers, be they black or white, to demoralize a population, which then when it gets to a certain P pitch, then the Lord must judge it, and he will use Satan and his forces to do it. And so a good way to do that is through the popular culture, music, films, television, yeah. uh, literature, things like that, or or uh, pseudo-literature. And if I, okay, if I could just mention something else. You, you mentioned literature, George. That's exactly what the Jesuit order's protocols of the learned elders of Zion says. says. We will flood the countries with filthy literature. Uh, okay, well, I'm not talking about things that are pornographic, first, although that could be part of it. But uh, way back when, you know, I'm 55, so back in the 80s, when I was in high school, we had certain books we were required to read. 
uh, like William Golding's uh, Lord of the Flies. And well, that's pornographic. You know, the guy yeah. getting kicked in the balls. Excuse me, getting kicked in the testicles and the Lord of the Flies. I mean, there were there were uh, things in there that were immoral. Go ahead. Okay, and then you had you know the cashier in the rye, uh, Animal Farm, Brave New World, nineteen eighty four. Now, now I've read those. Uh, my own volition. I can't, no, actually, I didn't read Cash in the Rye. So they wanted us to read. If you're Catch talking the like, by J.D. Salinger. That one? Yes. Yeah, that piece of trash. Yeah, okay, go ahead. See, all that trash was introduced through the federal government's uh, educational department. And there was a lot of people that didn't want to have any young people read that tr- junk. But they did it to us anyway, because we know we're all we're all in this together, and we can, could never separate from District of Columbia now and, and have some sort of a moral population, a moral culture, God forbid, and therefore banning and censoring certain books, because you must have censorship if you're going to have a high moral culture. Okay, so for what it's worth, William Golding was Jewish, but he was, I believe, Royal Office of Naval Intelligence during World War II. Salinger was Jewish, who's was also Army Intelligence. <laughs> and uh, I, I'm not, you know, making this up. Um, so, you, so was it plausible deniability for the Vatican? Oh no, we didn't write this. It was those Jews so, who did that. The Jews, that's right. But they'll never tell you the, the Jesuit or papal connection to those Jews who financed them, who gave them a platform. How do you get a platform when you write a book that every school in the country will mandate its reading? It wasn't because of the content or the ability of the writer. It has to be through influence of certain powers that are going to make people read those books in these schools. And that wasn't Jewish influence. I guarantee you that. Go ahead. <clears throat> well, and of course, you know, you made reference to rock and roll, like the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, uh, the so-called British Invasion band. And by the way, did you ever wonder why they call it the British Invasion? Isn't that a military term? Yeah. They're invading the also, enemy belligerents yeah, of America, the U.S. citizen enemy belligerents since March 9th, 1933. Go ahead. Also, the front page of the New York Times, was it the New York Times or Washington Post? Said back in February of 1964, when they, the Beatles, when the Beatles uh, landed in America, this is before they did the Ed Sullivan Show. It, the headline said, "The Beatles have conquered America." Hmm. Yeah, and they put that mind game on us right after the Kennedy assassination to try to make people forget and not pursue who the real killers were. So they bring this uh, nonsense and fanaticism of the Beatles over here and um, and try to devote or redirect people's attention to that idolatry. I was a victim of that. I watched every movie they had. I bought every album. I learned every guitar lead of George Harrison. I was an idol worshiper when it came to the Beatles. Go ahead. Okay, so you were probably completely clueless uh that it wasn't George Harrison playing the guitar, or at least on the albums. Yeah, I was was I was clueless to that. I sure worked hard to learn those leads. Mm-hmm. Now it it may have been Eric Clapton because um, it, it, before he joined the before Clapton joined the Yardbirds, he was a studio musician. Uh, oh, same like, thing. You think Clapton played the leads of the Beatles? Uh, several of them. Oh, okay. Now, there was a guy that could play lead guitar. Uh, okay. Uh, so, anyhow, it, <laughs> there again, I was going to mention this, but are you familiar with Mike Williams, who does Sage of Quay? No, I'm not. Oh, okay, I know that some of your listeners are, but um, uh, I guess back in 1962, I, I don't recall the date, I want to say in June, uh, Brian Epstein, the impresario, the manager of the Beatles, brought them in brought the Beatles uh, into, I guess, the EMI recording studios in London, and where they were, were introduced to George Martin, their engineer. And he said, hey, would you mind just performing a couple of tracks? And uh, so they did, and he said, well, thank you, fellas. Uh, <laughs> have a nice day. And his initial response was he wasn't particularly impressed. 
and he said, um, I guess he'd been in the music industry for years. This is George Martin, the Jesuitly trained George Martin, Sir, the future uh, Sir George Martin, um, who was also, I believe, Royal Intelligence, uh, MI6. MI6, foreign? Mm-hmm. Okay. So he, he was in the Royal Navy World War II, and he was Naval Intelligence. Okay. So he wasn't, okay. Martin was not impressed with the Beatles. He said they're basically a high school level cover band. And he thought that was going to be the end of it. So according to Mike Williams, about an hour or so later, um, uh, Martin got a call from somebody. He doesn't know who. And he said, yes, you will. He basically said, you will sign the Beatles and you will record with them. Mm hmm. That's interesting. Well, I guess it wasn't about their talent. It was about who they knew or who backed them. Kind of oh, okay. Mm-hmm. So the the, pro, the whoever was the caller on the other side probably said, "Hey, George, you don't want anything to happen to your brakes, do you?" Okay, George, car. you're kind of cutting out on me. You're 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 doing that stuff again. You're gonna break and and you you just kind of disappear for a second or so. So. Please keep, you know, near the mic and not turn away, okay? All right, uh, how, how's this? That's much better. You might even want to be hardwired into the computer, as we talked about previously. Oh, I, I am, so you I, are? Okay. I'm not sure. Well, then try okay, to stay but, near the microphone, okay? Okay, so this, this is back in 1962, so you're talking over 60 years ago. So George Martin got a call from somebody. Uh, would it? I don't know who there you go again. It. It's probably it somebody again. From... It cut out again right then and there. Go ahead. Hello, uh, check, 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 check. Yeah, no, you're fine. It just check. comes and goes. Oh, well, I'm not sure what the problem is. Okay, so George Martin got a call from somebody, probably MI6, saying that um, he doesn't have a choice in the matter. That he had to sign the Beatles and, and work with them. Mm-hmm. Does he write that in a book, or where did you hear that? Well, okay, this is according to Mike Williams, the Sage of Quay. The Sage of Quay, okay. Yes, who is considered to be the leading expert on the Beatles. I see, Mike Williams. All right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, their manager was a Knight of Malta, wasn't he? Um, bright of well, or some knighthood of some sort. Okay, well, I know that there was the case with the Rolling Stones. Mm-hmm. Uh, Rupert uh, Lowenstein was a, a knight of all. Mm-hmm. Are you there, George? Hello? Uh, yes, I am. Uh, yes. Okay. So go ahead. So anyways, we just need to continue on here and kind of have a flow of conversation. You know, you talk and then I'll talk and then the audience knows that we haven't disappeared when there's a silence. So go ahead, George. Oh, OK. Well, I do apologize for the technical difficulty. Um, so. I. OK, so by the way, a couple of months ago, you spoke with Bart Sabral, uh, who is the author of the book, A Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Moon. And uh, I, I listened to that on broadcast, and I've heard Bart on other broadcasts. And one of the things you dis- you discuss in passing was the basically the murder of Gus Grisham. Yes. Uh, and there are two other a- astronauts, uh, Ed White, and what was it? Ed White and who? Ch- uh, Chafee. Uh, I think so. Uh, Chaffee, yeah. Mm-hmm. Ch- Ch- Frank, was it Frank Chaffee? Uh, I had to check the name. So that took place on January the 27th, uh, 1967. And it, was for, it wasn't for a mission, it was for a test. And they're basically blown up in, in their capsule. Well, the Air Force pi- uh, officer... They were, burned, they were was, burned alive. Burned, scorched, burned alive. A horrible, terrible death. When Grissom said, if you can't get this testing right, then how do you expect us to get to the moon? And with that, that was about the it, and it's not surprising to see they were incinerated. But go ahead, George. Okay, so the the Air Force officer who was tasked with investigating their death 
was Thomas Bar- was Captain Thomas Barron, uh, who who was, I guess he he looked into death and he wrote two different reports, uh, one of which was something like 170 pages long, and another one was almost 300 pages long, in which he basically said they were murdered uh, because there was no reason for the explosion. Well, I see. Uh, they were murdered. There was no reason for the explosion. That's a terrible conclusion to come to. My, there might be somebody that might be investigated over that, George. We can't have that. Well, so anyhow, so Baron actually, now as I said, the the explosion took place on January the 27th. So exactly three months later, on April the 27th, um, Baron was, was killed in a car crash. Oh, well, that's a coincidence. That's a convenient coincidence. See, there are, George, there are coincidences, and then there are convenient coincidences. And <laughs> so, so this is a convenient coincidence to get rid of this troublemaker who actually says that Grissom was murdered and the other two. Shame on him. So he was in his, uh, Baron was in his car with his wife and daughter, and uh, they got hit by a train on, on the tracks. So, uh, <laughs> You know, these things ha- happen. Well, you know, I would like to see the details. Did the tracks have a, did the guards that went down or were there no guards on the tracks? And and did he just happen to cross the tracks at the right moment when the train was there to be to be terminated with his family? I mean, there's a, there's a bunch of things that could be, questions that could be asked that would lead to whether it was a coincidence or whether it was the design. And I'm convinced it was a design because they like killing the wife and children right along with their target, too. Like they did to John F. Kennedy Jr. And I'm, he's dead and they killed his wife and and his sister-in-law. So that was a, that was a, a triple bonus there. But go ahead. Oh, OK. So now I, <coughs> excuse me, I excuse me. Well, might want to take a drink of water, George. Yeah, uh, yes. Well, here it is in late May, and uh, um, <laughs> the uh, allergy seasons are kicking off in full, full bloom. Okay, so anyhow, yes, I'd heard of Gresham, but uh, and Ed White and uh, Ch- uh, was it Frank Chafee, and but I had never heard of Tom Barron until the other day. So, um, is probably. G- a good idea not to look into mysterious deaths because well you might have an accident yourself there you go you can't can't look at can't ask some real questions here now that that's forbidden <laughs> just do what you're told be a good boy do your reporting like we want you to do it and you'll have a long life and make money and we'll have good press for you and yeah just like john swinton but go ahead john swinton yeah, John Swinton, I think, wrote for the New York Times in the late 1800s, and he said we're nothing but a bunch of professional prostitutes. And we lie every day, but he didn't get there to that position until he had first been doing some lying every day. He finally came out and told the truth. But then you have William Randolph Hearst and Henry Luce and these other professional liars working for the Pope, controlling the press, Rupert Murdoch. He's right. The press is controlled. You can't tell the truth. You dare tell the truth. And you run the risk of uh, suffering a little accident. Yeah. Uh, so, so you you might end up flying out of a fourteen-story building. Yeah, just like what's his name well, fell off a sixteen-floor building. What was his name? He was the Secretary of Navy at the time. Uh, Forstall. Forstall, James Forstall, and a good Catholic. So the good Catholic became disobedient, and we'll throw him out of a out of a sixteenth-floor window there in Maryland. Yeah. Bethesda Hospital, Bethesda Naval Hospital, they threw him out of that one, I believe. Yep. Uh, well, you know, um, the, you know, that, you know, speaking of accidents, I guess on Sunday, uh, the, the 19th, so this is just a couple of days ago, the same day as the Pope Francis interview, uh, I guess the president of Iran was killed in a helicopter crash. His name is Ibrahim Razni. Mm-hmm. Uh, I guess in English, that would be uh, R-A-I-S-E. He was 63, along with the foreign minister. I didn't catch his name, but um, anyhow, 
So, so, uh, they, so they've murdered a head of Croatia. And oh, well, murdered, as you, well, as you, the, the, Iran. I'm saying, I'm summing it up, George. They killed the, what, the prime minister of Croatia a week or so ago, and then they're going to kill the head of Iran. All, all coincidence, George. These things just happen, and, you know, he's... Well, you just have to not understand why at all. It's a coincidence, and that answers everything. But go ahead. Okay, so I, I think you're, uh, um, I believe that you're talking, you're referring to the prime minister of Slovakia. Slovakia, pardon me, Slovakia. Mm-hmm. No, Catholic Slovakia, Catholic Croatia, yeah, but Catholic Slovakia, you're right. And uh, that was Robert, was it Rico, I believe? Mm-hmm. Although he survived. Oh, okay. Well, they, sh- what, they shoot him three or five times, something like that? Robert, uh, so, India, I think, yes, his name is Robert DeFico. This, that oh. was last week. He was the, oh, last week. Uh, he's the prime minister of Slovakia. So mm-hmm. I think they're just simply trying to send him a message, because if they wanted him dead, he would be dead. That's right. Just like Reagan, they, you know, they sent him a message uh, shot by, the, um, by his... Um, associate, <laughs> not by Hinckley, but by Jerry Parr, yeah, and sent him a little message, and, uh, you know, you need to start towing the line here, otherwise we'll put George W. Herbert Walker Bush in power now, Reagan. You've been faithful to us for all these years. You know, you were the counterfeit candidate in California, and, you know, you want to get out of line, be a little bit too patriotic. We're going to have to, you know, teach a little lesson here now, boy. Go ahead, George. Okay. So, as, as I said, if they want you dead, They'll make you. They'll make sure they succeed because they've been doing this for centuries. Because when they hatch a plot to kill somebody, they have redundancies. I.e., they have a plan B, plan C, and so forth. That they, they look at all the exits. They look at all the angles, and they're going to make sure <laughs> you don't leave alive. That's right. That's exactly right. They were the masters of assassination. And um, this is what they do. And the people just don't get the fact that these are conspiracies. And the conspirators need to be punished. But oh no, can't do that. It was a mistake. It was a coincidence, George. Yeah. Uh, And so, boy, well, I mean, there's been... They've been doing this for a long time. I mean, assassinating people. Uh, yeah, the Jesuits are the master assassins. There's no greater assassins than the Jesuits, and they have their tools to, to carry it out. One of the tools is the CIA. Another tool is a certain FBI agents. Another tool is the mafia. <clears throat> they have a whole host of strings to their bow, so to say. Uh, indeed, and of course, you know they could, you know they'll use. Uh, different people for different reasons, uh, or you know, they could, you know, shoot somebody, have a plane crash, helicopter crash, car crash, heart attack. Uh, they have, uh, as you say, a whole bunch of different techniques that they can make something appear to be a suicide, mm-hmm. and and they say, well, gee, that seems suspicious. Uh, yeah, they <laughs> love uh, Gary Webb. Should- yeah, they love killing people in the hospital too. That's a perfect place to kill people. It's, it looks, it's under the auspices of some medical doctor, and then he just uh, ter- he was terminated or he died suddenly, like Jackie Kennedy, and a host of others. But go ahead, George. Uh, okay, and uh, of course, you know who gave? Uh, so, you know, I was reading a couple of years ago. Was it Doctor Mary's Monkey about the death uh, of? Uh, Jack Ruby. Oh, yeah. I have it right here on my shelf. Dr. Mary's Monkey by, what's his name? Uh, oh. Haslam, H-A-S-L-A-M. Great book. In fact, there's a picture of David Ferry in that book in a Jesuit Cossack when he was at a novitiate. Yep. Uh, so he, well, David Ferry. David Ferry, Ferry for the listeners, David Ferry was involved in the Kennedy assassination. So he's right there in his Jesuit Cossack in that book. Go ahead, George. Ah, uh, okay. So do you think he may have been secretly ordained? Wouldn't surprise me. 
It's the Jesuit undercover. They have Jesuits undercover and they have Jesuits that are up front. This is how the SEALs were, were modeled after. You have Navy SEALs that are faces and Navy SEALs that are heels. Navy SEALs that are openly SEALs and then Navy SEALs that are not openly SEALs. And they're the ones you don't see coming. They get you. They're called the heels. And so it is with the Jesuits, the same thing. Jesuits of the fourth vow, you don't see them coming. And then the Jesuits that are up front, the, you do see they're coming. There's faces and there's heels. But go ahead. Oh, well, you know, it's funny. I, I thought that was a wrestling term. Or those are wrestling terms, faces and heels. I don't know. I've never heard it. it might be. Okay, so I, I kid you not. I was into that you know, a long time ago. But uh, basically, in professional wrestling, you know, you have good guys and you have bad guys. Uh, the good guys are essentially the faces, and the bad guys are the heels. And they can, they'll switch week to week or periodically. One week they're enemies, next week they're friends. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, um, and it's incredibly, well, Jesuitical. I mean, yes, it is. It's perfectly Jesuitical. Yeah. They're masters of deception. As J. Edgar Hoover called them the masters of deceit, even though he was not referring to the Jesuits, but the Jesuits are absolutely implicated there. But look, St. George, it's fun to, to deceive people. It's fun to deceive them. It's fun to incite them to kill each other. It's fun to incite propaganda to get them to act upon it. We just love doing it. And they do it over and over. That's why they're a criminal organization. And they deserve to be all arrested and prosecuted and put to death for high treason. Every last one of them. Yep. Well, well yeah, uh, yes, I agree. Now, now we're, we're just talking about current events. Uh, events that have taken place, say, in last week or so. Well, the helicopter crash of the uh, president of Iran. Now, you may be wondering how... How is the CIA or, or the Jesuits involved with that? Well, I'm not exactly sure. I just, it's just pure speculation on, on my part. The arm of the church is long. That's what the inquisitors used to say. The arm of the church is long. Through some means, some individual, some event, we're going to get to you. And so this is how they do it now. Some individual, some secret society, some discredited individual, given my, whatever, we're going to use someone to do this, to get to our target. All the so, while, plausible deniability. Oh, okay, so it would be difficult for the United States to facilitate, uh, to have facilitated the crash of this pr president because um, the United States doesn't officially have diplomatic relations with Iran. Uh, it hasn't had that since 1980 or so. So you're talking almost well, 45 years. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, so they use the Vatican use some other proxy to get to him. Now, why they do this, I don't know. Maybe he was being disobedient. Uh, who knows? Yeah, it's some reason. I don't know what the reason is, but we could probably find it if we did an investigation of his life and his policies and what he was up to. But we have to remember that the Jesuits are out to destroy Shia Islam. And the headquarters for Shia Islam is Iran. So they will put up tre treacherous leaders to betray those people to ultimately be killed in the future. And that's what I maintain they're wanting to do that right now. Okay, so you know, I know we were just talking a moment ago about the prime minister of Slovakia, uh, Robert FICO, I believe. Um, uh, I believe, I hope I'm not butchering his name, but I know that Slovakia has not been on board with the World Health Organization. Uh, they have one of the lowest vaccination rates of any country in Europe. Oh, oh God forbid you're not your children. What do you hate your children? You're abusing them, you know, so they don't get sick. Try it. Good for them. They'll have a strong population, they'll have a virile manhood. They'll have reproduction and a growing population. And if they handle their economics right, they'll have an expanding economy. So the more people that are born, the more they have jobs and the more they have a growing national wealth. Yeah, that would be wonderful. But you can't do it with all these mandated deadly. Uh, it, it, indeed. 
So the uh, so has my connection been okay over the last few few minutes? Seems like it. I think maybe once or so, but it seems like it's better, George, as long as you're up to your microphone. Okay. So anyhow, so quick question for you. Do you know who the actor Dabney Coleman was? No, I don't. Okay, so he just died uh, the other day. He was 92 years old. He was born on April of January 3rd, 1932. And he got his undergrad degree from U University of Texas at Austin, where he is a member of Phi Delta Theta, which is a men's uh, fraternity. And they put heavy emphasis on future actors. So as I said, he went to the Secular University of Texas at Austin. Then it, Austin uh, is the leftist, socialist, communist city of Texas. Unfortunately, the capital, I believe. Uh, uh, yes. So uh, it's, that is correct. So, yeah. in the early, so in the early 1950s, he got constructed in the U.S. Army, and he spent a couple of years in what was, uh, or at least a year or so, it was West Berlin. So then he got out, and then I guess he moved to Hollywood and became an actor. Now, he's probably known or best known for his uh, comedic parts. Uh, he was in Tootsie, 9 to 5, um, short timer. Um, oh, what was that movie? Oh, Dragnet. But he also had. had oh, uh, yes. Yeah. Okay, um, that anti-Bible, pro-Catholic series. You might want to take a drink of water, George, please. Okay, uh, y yes, uh, he was in, but he was also he was in a, a number. He had a number of dramatic roles, uh, such as he was in oh, Brotherhood of the Bell. He played an FBI agent, uh, Towering Inferno, where he played a fire chief. He was also a Navy officer in uh, the Battle of Midway. So he uh, often played... The way, if, the listeners, if the listeners haven't watched Brotherhood of the Bell with that Canadian actor, Glenn Ford, you need to watch it. Because you got that Robert Conrad there accusing him of, well, maybe the bell, maybe the bell's the Vatican. <laughs> so he tries to poke fun anybody that believes right? it's, in the, it's a Vatican conspiracy. That's all in the Brotherhood of the Bell. Go ahead. Oh, okay, so I, I believe you have a conflation with William Conrad. Um, oh, yeah, William, uh, Con William Conrad. William Con the, it's the oh, heavyweight okay. guy with the mustache. Yes, with the mustache. You know, Frank Cannon. Um, yeah. So you had one Freemason jockeying with another Freemason. Mm -hmm. And um, so, of course, well, yes, Glenn, um, Glenn Ford was born in Canada, but he was also uh, a Navy reservist for something like 25 years. So he almost really had an intelligence background. Also, uh, Robert, I'm sorry, William Conrad, in addition to being a high-level Freemason, was also a fighter pilot in World War II. So <laughs> they both almost certainly had intelligence backgrounds. Yeah. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. And when they were pushing the race mixing, when they were pushing the miscegenation in Hollywood, one of the movies that they put out was The Blackboard Jungle with um, Glenn Ford and Sidney Portier and making, uh, and also Vic Morrow. Yes. Vic Morrow was the bad white guy. Sidney Portier was the righteous, good black man. And Glenn Ford was the teacher. So it was more pro-white, anti-black propaganda, furthering the miscegenation process of the Jesuit order here in America. And Sidney Portier, by the way, from what the count has told me, is a member of every knighthood. He's a fanatical Roman Catholic. He goes to mass on a regular basis. Or, uh, or at least he was. At least he was. Yeah, he's, he's deceased now. He's in hell now and awaiting the great white throne judgment. But go ahead. Okay, so you're talking about uh, so the antagonist in, the, in that movie, Blackboard Jungle, was uh, Victor Morowitz. Yeah, v yeah I mean, Victor Mor Morrow. Uh, <laughs> Morowitz was that his name? Morowitz. Morowitz. Oh, okay. I see. So you got a black, <laughs> you got a Catholic, and you got a Jew. Exactly what the Ku Klux Klan warned about. So you got the Jew, Vic Morrow, you got the black, Sidney Poitier, and you got the Roman Catholic uh, um, teacher there. What was his name? Uh, Glenn Ford. 
Blackboard. And, now, it's interesting. Blackboard Jungle was the first film to feature rock music. Uh, they played um, Rock Around the Clock. Right? Yeah, yeah, Rock Around the Clock. Yeah, 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 run, 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 run. That's right. That's exactly right. Hmm. Uh, okay, so there's no social engineering going on there. Um, <laughs> yeah. And of course, remember, well, one of the uh, supporting actors in that movie, Blackboard Jungle, was a young Jamie Farr, who is probably best remembered as Maxwell Klinger on the TV show uh, MASH. Yes, he did do other parts, but I believe that was his first uh, acting part. I see. Mm-hmm. Very good. Yeah, it's okay. Jesuit Theater 101. We just need to identify the actors and their associations and their and their theories and their philosophies. They're shoving down the throats of the white Anglo-Saxon Protestants and Baptists of North America to further drive us into sin and disobedience to God, not reading his Bible, the King James, and to fit us for destruction. But go ahead, George. Okay, so, you know, I believe Jamie Farr is still alive. He's probably about 90 or so. But uh, now he's an anomaly in Hollywood, in, in that he's not Jewish, and he's not uh, Catholic. He's Lebanese Eastern Orthodox. Mm. Well, that's pretty close to Roman Catholic. Go ahead. Well, just like of the course, Orthodox Church, just like the Orthodox Church, is pretty close to Roman Catholic. Only difference between the Orthodox Church and the Catholic Church is Tweedledee and Tweedledum. They all serve the Pope at the top, all false religion, no preaching of the gospel, all state religions. Uh, okay, so yes, indeed. So, yeah, but uh, um, also a movie that I well I did make reference to it was the 1974 Inferno, and are you familiar with that? It was with um, an all-star cast. In addition to Dabney Coleman, you had Paul Newman, Steve McQueen, yeah. Yeah. William Holden, yeah. uh, oh, the uh, Fred Astaire. O.J. Simpson. I, I know we've talked about this movie, but yes. O. All, the, all the serial adulterers who have one great big adulterous movie having wonderful times. Yeah, go ahead, George. Oh, okay. Hey, no way's perfect. So why do I bring up uh, Towering Inferno? Well, it, it seems as if you, if you watched films of the 1970s, the world was coming to an end because a popular theme in a lot of movies w- was disasters. You know, in addition to Harry Inferno, you had Earthquake, The Poseidon Adventure, the various airport movies. You always thought <laughs> somebody, everything. Yeah, somebody else. Apart. Somebody thought because you cut out again. You know, somebody's up to this, and of course we can't read the Bible because we know the Earth can't be destroyed, and we know that's just not going to happen because Jesus Christ has to return a second time without sin into salvation. He's got to set up the throne of David, the kingdom of heaven once again, and uh, so the Earth is not going to be destroyed. But we just got to get these people away from reading that Bible before we can sucker them into these nonsensical ideologies. Well, okay, if I could just bring up one other point, I realized on a recent stream with with Steve uh, Drake, uh, you. Brought up, uh, Steve brought up, oh, talk about the concept of predictive programming, specifically the pandemic and other ideas, or the alleged pandemic. Well, uh, Towering Inferno was, I believe, the first time in at least an American film you actually saw people jumping out of a burning building. And uh, now, granted, planes didn't crash into it or allegedly crash into it, but there was a, this fire. So you had dozens of people who in the film who jumped out to escape maybe, maybe it's a little predictive programming for 9-11 well hey that would i'm not saying and when was that movie made george 1974 24 yeah, well they build the world trade center the towers there what i think in the 80s yeah, well it, well construction began in 19 <laughs> well, okay they broke ground in 66 but construction began in 68 and they opened up in 73 or 75, so thereabouts. Oh, so it's a perfect timing for Towering and Towering Inferno. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, that's what we're going to do with the World Trade Center now. You know, 20 years down, 30 years, 40 years down the road is what we're going to do. <laughs> well, you, you know, I, I know you brought this up. You know, the, the actual construction for the World Trade Center, as I said, began in 1968. And something you and others have brought up is 911 became the national 
emergency dialing code in 1968. Yes. So, so 1968, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So have you looked at all the major events that took place in that year, 1968, that have a direct impact on the world now? Uh, you got the 1968 Palestinian Covenant that's revived from 64, going to push the Jews into the sea with Yasser Arafat. <clears throat> and you have the, what, the assassination of Martin Luther King. You have the assassination of Robert Kennedy. Um, you got quite a few things going on in 1968. Okay, so uh, you, uh, you probably know all these. Well, the Club of Rome on April the 7th was officially established. 19, 19, oh, sorry about that. Um, George, uh, who's calling you? Um, it's I, want you tell, I want you to tell your girlfriend to stop calling you, George, when we're on the radio together, okay? Well, <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll do. Um, okay. And um, well, as you said, um, anyhow, um, <laughs> That, that reminds me, uh, somebody ran into, uh, I guess, ran into Milson Brohl in a restaurant in L.A., and uh, I, I guess he's there with a fairly attractive woman, Milton Brohl is, and he said, oh, um, the little fellow who walked to the restaurant and said, oh, uh, are you Milton Brohl? And he said, yes, I, yes, I am. And how does the punchline go? I said, uh, well, I sincerely hope so because I'm being awfully uh, fresh with his wife. So I, I'm sorry, I, I, I butchered the joke. So, oh, so that was his wife. Oh, okay. Yes. <coughs> so, you might want to take a drink now, George. Time to have a drink, okay? Yes. So, in terms of saying things that are going on in 1968. So the Club of Rome was officially established on April the 7th of that year. And one of the architects of that was David Rockefeller. David, that wonderful, high moral, patriotic man, David Rockefeller. I can hardly believe that, George. Club of no. Rome? Club of Rome? Did you say Club of Rome established by David Rockefeller? Did you say that? Well, one of them. He is one of the founders. Sounds to me like he has a papal connection, which the John Birch Society wants to deny. But go ahead. Uh, okay. Gosh, we're we're uh, an hour and two minutes here now, so if you have another topic we can deal with, and other than that, we need to think about uh, giving our listeners relief, you know, maybe time to sign off. But go ahead, George. Okay, so there, well, there are other topics, but, but I'll just uh, bring up one. Um, the, well, as you I'm going to have to uh, flush it out uh, next time. Well, <laughs> yeah, I teased you about this last week, and I said I wanted to look into serial killers and uh, mass murders going back to the 1960s, but owing to time constraints, I'm not going to be able to elaborate on, on that. So, okay, well, maybe we can do it next Tuesday, George. You can uh, hold that off for then. Uh, all right. And um, so, anyhow, if people. Have any uh, so shall I give my contact information? Please do. Yeah, please give your contact info and maybe a summary, and then we'll be good to go. Okay, so if people have any questions, comments, concerns, critiques, please email me at George Widger at gmail.com. G E O R W D. Just cut out again, George. You got to give it again. You cut out. Go ahead. Okay, if people have any questions, comments, concerns, critiques, they can email me. At G E O R W I D G E R one nine six nine at gmail dot com. If they have any questions, as I said, if they want me to go over a topic, go over a topic again, uh, I'd be glad to do so. Uh, please give me some time to respond, like twenty four hours or so. Um, also, you said, um, uh, do you mind if I just conclude with this? Oh, brother, I have you here for you. Just go ahead. Okay, so I don't have anything concrete in terms of saying uh, Catholic connections, but recently there are a couple of semi-prominent people who died. There was, I guess, a reporter for CNN, a uh, cable news network, named Alice Stewart. She was 58 years old. Uh, she died a few days ago from unknown causes. 
And then, I guess, a couple weeks ago, uh, a former baseball player, Major League Baseball player, Sean Burroughs, died. His father, Jeff, had a more impressive career. But uh, Burroughs, the younger Burroughs, Sean, was 43. I guess he had dropped his son off at Little League practice in Southern California. So you have this reporter, this female reporter, who is 58, and you have this ex-baseball player who is 43. And they, the baseball player died of a heart attack. And You wonder if he I, got I the mean, jab. You wonder if he got jabbed. You know, he got the Jesuit death dart. Well, hey, I, I don't want to be accused of disseminating um, medical misinformation. <laughs> uh, yeah, right. Yeah. So I should yeah. have seen that, yeah. Well, and, uh, you know, these things are becoming all too common. People who are young or relatively young are dying from causes they would not have, say, five years ago. Yep. So if you had somebody who was dropping dead at the age of 43 of a heart attack in 2019, you know, he would have been morbidly obese or something, or he would have had several other health issues. Yeah. Well, it's just a host of things that the Jesuits are doing to us because we're enemy belligerents that are in occupied territories or in a military government, have been for 91 years, and until the American people wake up to see what's been done to them, it's only going to get worse. So, Brother George, welcome to the – I'm glad you were on the broadcast with us today, and thank you for your contact information. And uh, Lord willing, we'll be together, together again next Tuesday. Okay, so over there, John Phillips, thank you for tuning in today. I have a book, Vatican Assassins, one of the house of my friends. Go to my website, vaticanassassins.org. You can pick up a CD. I'll reprint it one of these days, hopefully this year. And go to 24-7 World Radio. You can purchase my broadcast for the last 10 or 11 years. And I also have some other things there of uh, your interest in edification. Please pray for George and me uh, two hours or two minutes a day, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. And uh, please continue to read your Reformation King James English Bible in its present uh, clarified edition of 1769. And um, you may send your donation to RBPB Church at Comcast.net if you want to use PayPal. RBPB Church at Comcast.net. Or you can send it by PayPal or uh, pardon me, Cash App at uh, Eric, E R I C J J O N, Phelps, P H E L P S, the Cash App. Or you can send a check what us oldsters normally do. And you can send a check to RBT, P.O. Box 306, Newmanstown, Pennsylvania, 17073. So until we meet next time, may the Lord bless you as you read his word according to the AV 1611 English Bible and for us English-speaking people. And so until then, George Maranatha, listeners Maranatha, and Lord bless.